Hello again, Netrunner fans. Willing Dunn here. This is the first of a new video series I'm going to do on the core set of Android Netrunner. Unlike my normal data pack reviews, this is going to be more of a retrospective in which I look at the core set from the perspective of 2015 and the level of maturity that the game has now. This is also going to be a little more of an opinion piece than my normal reviews because I'm going to be analyzing the things that I think the designers got right with the initial Netrunner card pool and maybe a few of the things that they didn't get so right. We're going to take this faction by faction. We're going to start with Runner and specifically the Anarch faction. As one final word of preface, I want to say that the high quality design of Netrunner's core set I think has a lot to do with the massive popularity and success of the game. I think if it weren't for the fact that the card pool was so robust and well made to begin with, the game probably wouldn't have taken off and we wouldn't be where we're at today. I wanted to say that right at the beginning because I think that my analysis of the cards might paint the core set in a more negative light than I intend. A lot of what I'm going to be doing is looking at the game from the perspective of the knowledge that we have now and the things that we know about the game now having it having it been played thousands and thousands of times. The first card we're going to talk about is definitely a mainstay of Anarch and that's Noise Hacker Extraordinaire. One of the biggest things that I think the designers got right about the core set was releasing a lot of the game's most powerful cards in the initial card pool. The initial three IDs for the game are certainly no exception, and even to this day we see a lot of popularity in both Kate and Noise. Noise does something for Anarch that I think a lot of other cards have tried to do and not succeeded at, which is making Archives a real threatening server that the Corp has to address. If we look at the other two factions, like both Shaper and Criminal, we see that Shaper is good against R&D, and we see that Criminal is really good against HQ, and both of those factions have quite a few cards that address those specific servers and make those servers a unique type of threat. Now, Anarch hasn't exactly been very good at that with Archives, with the huge exception of Noise. I love with Noise how differently you have to play as the corporation, and I also think that if you're playing as Noise, he plays very differently than a lot of other runners. He tends to be a little more passive, a lot more about installing stuff and milling cards, and maybe going for a sort of alpha strike. And if you played early Netrunner, you can remember how insanely powerful no Noise was, especially prior to the printing of Jackson Howard. Overall, Noise is one of my favorite designs on a runner ID period just because of how unique the effect is how it encourages you to build a deck in a very specific and obvious way and like I was just talking about how differently you have to play with and against it I think noise is a standard that we should hold a lot of other IDs to is is the ID going to have this level of impact on the deck and the game I think a lot of IDs, it's easy to say no to that, and I'm so glad that Noise, as this type of unique, powerful ID, was in the core set and part of the initial seed card pool for the game. The next card that we have is Deja Vu. I think this is the type of card that basically every card game needs. Ways to recur effects and be able to replay them, I think adds for a lot of interesting decision making. It makes certain effects a lot more powerful because you can reuse them. And I really do like the two virus cards thing. I think that's largely the way that Deja Vu was used in the early stages of Netrunner. And I think to this day, a lot of decks are getting back two viruses with it pretty routinely. And I think that it makes sense to have this kind of thing in the initial card pool. I like giving it to Anarch because they tend to need some way to do something that the other factions can't do. And Recursion in early Netrunner was something they could do and the other factions really couldn't do. Next up we have Demolition Run. This was the first of the sabotage type effects for Anarch where you'd be able to trash cards that you wouldn't usually be eligible to trash, especially cards that don't have trash costs. This card really just never saw much play. 
I think the core problem with Demolition Run is the fact that it only allows you to tra- to run on HQ or R&D. I'm not exactly sure why that restriction was on the card. It seems to me like it'd be okay if you could just run a remote and trash whatever's there. I think in early Netrunner especially, it would have been awesome to have something to trash like a San San or like an Adonis or something like that. And I don't really understand why you wouldn't why it wouldn't be fair to just pay two credits to be able to trash the thing. We've seen cards kind of like that later on, like Singularity, which allows you to trash all of the cards in the server. It's also a double and it has some other issues. I'm not exactly sure why Demolition Run couldn't just trash any card accessed on any server rather than just HQ or R&D. One of the core things that both the early players and the designers got wrong about this card was the idea that it would be good to access a bunch of cards and be able to trash all of those. I think from the perspective of the modern game, we've learned that if you're digging with three with a medium for like three or four cards, or you're accessing three or four cards out of HQ, that's probably good enough to win the game on its own, and you don't really need to include crap like this to be able to get more value out of like a medium for four. This card, I think, would have been a much stronger design if it allowed you to trash a single card and you were able to use it on any server, not just those two centrals. Next up is everybody's favorite way to crush a remote server, which is Stim Hack. It seems kind of strange looking back at this card. I think this is one of the really major sleepers of the core set. This was the type of card where it didn't really see a lot of play in early Netrunner, and now it sees pretty extensive play in a large variety of decks. Now, some of that had to do with cards that were printed that synergize well with it. You know, like Personal Workshop is a pretty obvious example, SMC, Clone Chip, a lot of cards that let you spend credits mid-run made this card a lot stronger. But I think one of the big things to talk about is how weak the early ice was for uh, the corporation. In early Netrunner, there wasn't really a good way to tax the runner in the way that we think about it today. There was Tollbooth, there were maybe a handful of other big ice like the Bioroids, but in general, we didn't have ways to tax the runner to the extent that we can in 2015. So Stimhack has gotten a new breath of fresh air. It's been taken into a lot of decks that would have never considered it in the past because being able to crack a really expensive, especially remote, but occasionally also the centrals, is something that modern players want and is easily worth the one influence. Overall, I'd say Stimhack is the best designed run event in the core set. Next up, we have Cyber Feeder. This was an early piece of hardware that saw quite a bit of play, largely due to the popularity and I would say kind of dominance of noise in the early stages of Netrunner tournament play. This was one of the first recurring credit effects that anyone even considered, and it was a big part of Noise's early economy. You gotta think that early Noise really didn't have access to a lot of the tools that we take for granted today, especially cash, so it was really just installing the viruses that you had. You pretty much had to play three copies of most of the viruses that were printed period and you were still pawning them to Aesop's pawn shop but the viruses were a lot more expensive on average so something like cyber feeder pulled a lot of weight saving you credits on those installations and I think this card's largely used the same way as it was in 2013 as it is today the key smart move with cyber feeder in my mind is that it can be used for the viruses or to pump icebreakers That's usually going to mean that early in the game you can install viruses, it's going to pull a lot of weight there. Later in the game, it's going to be recurring credits so that you can make more runs because you're going to be able to use your icebreakers. That's really smart, I really like that, and I think it's contributed a lot to the playability of this card. Next up is the classic Anarch console, Grimoire. This is such a brilliant design. This is definitely my favorite console that was in the core set. This is the cheapest way, even in 2015, to get 2MU, 
at the three cost. And also the virus bonus thing it really obviously fit with noise. And even to this day, we're seeing people extensively play this card for its interaction with the virus things. So the fact that you can get cheap MU and the fact that it does the virus thing really strong with this card. I would have liked to see something kind of like a hybrid of the mem strips card and this. So like it gives you two or three MU that you can only use for viruses. I think it was kind of lame and continues to be kind of lame that some decks, quite a few of them, include this card just because it's 2MU for cheap. Next up, we have the gold standard of barrier breakers. That's Corroder. One of the biggest problems I perceive in the core set is the initial Anarch breakers. And I think that Corroder got some things right that the other ones didn't get right. But I think there's still some problems with Corroder. Now, first of all, Corroder was too influence, and I think that's absolutely necessary. I really like that. I think that you should be spending influence on a rig in every faction. I think if you want to have a reasonable breaker setup, you should have to spend influence on it. You should have to play kind of a janky breaker setup if you're not spending any influence on it. Now, Corroder Costing 2 forced a lot of early decks, especially criminal decks, to spend at least four of their influence on getting a couple copies of this thing. Now, I think it, I said it's the gold standard because it has the plus one strength, break a barrier subroutine. Both of them cost a credit. Really, the only problem I have with Corroder is that it's a little too cost effective at the two install cost. I think it pretty easily could have been like three or maybe even four, and we would still play it because it's going to be the cheapest way to deal with these barriers. If we compare, to, compare it to Gordian Blade, it's pretty much the same thing except Gordian is two more to install. Gordian's also an additional influence, but it's got that additional little tacked on ability that with the persistent strength thing. I think you could have pretty easily made Corroder cost three or four, and it would still see just as much play today. Next up, we have one of the most extensively played cards from the initial Anarch card pool, and that's Data Sucker. This is easily one of my least favorite designs ever printed for Netrunner. I think the idea of this card is totally sound and makes a lot of sense. Having some sort of program that helps out your icebreakers, it makes them less expensive to use, makes them more efficient, things like that. That idea is good, but the particular design of this card has so many problems. I'm of the opinion that a card pool without Data Sucker would be more interesting and would have more interaction between ice and icebreakers than a card pool with Data Sucker. I see two main issues with Data Sucker. The first is the fact that it combines with Parasite to kill ice that you don't even have to encounter. The big issue with that is that it makes some of the strongest, most impenetrable, quote-unquote, ice in the game easily destroyed and easily defeated for basically no cost to the runner. So this made things like Tollbooth and Archer and some of the really monstrous, keep-them-out-of-your-server-type ice way less effective because you could just kill the ice and it would cost you essentially nothing. I think one of the easiest fixes to that would just be to have Data Sucker boost the strength of your icebreaker rather than shrinking the ice that you're encountering. Even with that change, we would run into the second main problem I see, which is just that Data Sucker is way too efficient and just costs too little in terms of everything. It should at very least be more influence. I think it could also be more to install. I think the virus thing is such a throwaway with this card, unfortunately. Frankly, criminals should not have been able to import this card for like two influence to get a couple copies of it when they also have access to Desperado. Early Netrunner was very much dominated by either criminals or noise, and both of those decks extensively played this card. This is just too cost effective. It should really just shouldn't have made it to the initial card pool, and I think it's caused a lot of problems with the ice icebreaker interaction that definitely weren't intended. Data Sucker also exacerbates the problems I'm going to talk about with the fixed strength breakers. 
those would have been a lot more interesting if a card like Data Sucker wasn't in the pool. And I think we've seen some kind of remakes of Data Sucker that are a lot more interesting, like Net Ready Eyes. Data Sucker really just should have never been printed. I think it's a huge reason why Anarch wasn't really that popular. It was just so easy to import all of the best Anarch cards into non-Anarch decks, and that continues to be the case. The community at large has whined about Data Sucker far less than some of the other cards that I'm going to take issue with in these videos, but I really think that Data Sucker is at the heart of a bunch of problems of the Ice Icebreaker interaction, and really this card just needs to go. Now we've seen some sort of soft solutions to Data Sucker, especially Lotus Field, a lot of people talk about Lotus Field as if it's an anti yog card, and I think that's just wrong. It's an anti-data sucker card. The thing is with Lotus Field, it's finally a piece of ice where 100% of code gates can't just be totally annihilated by data sucker yog. Now we have exactly one code gate that can't just be annihilated by that combination. We've also seen some stuff like things that purge virus counters, you know, like the Cyberdex stuff. I don't think these approaches are going to fix Data Sucker. I don't like the idea of printing counters to Data Sucker. I really just think that this card needs to get either remade and rebalanced or just outright removed from the card pool. Next up, we have everyone's favorite Daemon, which is Jin. This card, I think, was a pretty good design. Being able to search your deck for virus programs and put them in your hand was really nice for noise, and it just gave you a constant stream of things to install and do. I also really like the idea of giving these non-icebreaker MUs. Just the idea of having cheap MU that you can only spin on a specific thing, I think has been an idea that's worked out generally pretty well, although a lot of the cards that do that sort of stuff are pretty underpowered. I think that this could have just cost one, I think it probably could have cost like one influence as well. I don't think this is really the type of thing that you were going to be playing in a lot of non-noise decks anyway. And I do really like to see this card even in modern deck lists just because it always does something kind of interesting being able to tutor up kind of a toolbox of viruses or even just giving you a constant stream of things like cash. This card overall I think is a pretty good design. I think it's got a lot of right ideas and I think more things like this would have been good for noise early in the game. Next up we have arguably the most powerful R&D multi-access effect in the game, which is Medium. This design I think is pretty strong and I think it made a lot of sense. Now this has been a card that's seen a lot of play over time and I think it's been a card that we've proven is worth the three influence in quite a few decks. I really like the idea of this. I like that you have to make runs in order to be able to charge it up. They haven't really given us a whole lot of ways to charge it. Otherwise, most of those effects are pretty janky and they, they're, they're really conditional. This has been a really interesting card throughout the history of the game. It really feels terrible as the corp to be sitting there watching them charge up a medium and you have to show them four cards off the top of your deck. This is the type of thing that has to exist in the game. I really like the idea of some sort of powerful give the runner inevitability. They're eventually just going to score out. I really like this card. It's largely been punished by things by like with like uh, you know snare and things like that. But I, I like the idea of this existing in the game giving Anarch a huge deep dig effect. This has been such a bomb, and it's been such a justifiable bomb. I like this design quite a bit. I think overall I just keep this card as it is. Next up is the first of the fixed strength breakers. This is Mimic. Generally the idea of the fixed strength breaker was a good one. I think it's really interesting when you have something like Mimic and they res a four strength sentry and you just can't deal with it. That's a really interesting sort of dynamic that you have to be on the lookout of. It lets court players tailor their ice to defeat their anticipated icebreaker and things like that. I think the fixed strength breakers are generally a good idea. My biggest beef with Mimic is the idea that it costs one influence. I think that was a massive mistake. I think Mimic easily could have cost two or maybe even more. 
and it would have been a lot more interesting as a card because as it is, virtually every deck is going to consider including one copy of Mimic, and especially within Modern Shaper, and even to a lesser extent within Modern Criminal, you have so many tutors and card draw effects and ways to access things in your deck that you only really need one copy of Mimic. Frankly, you should have had to spend more influence if you were going to do that. And like I was talking about before, I think one of the big philosophies of the rig should be that every faction has to spend influence to get a fairly premium rig. If you're not spending influence on a rig, you should have to play some kind of janky or rigs. Mimic has just been a huge way to deal with centuries throughout the course of the game, and I think it would have been a lot more interesting if it A, cost more influence, and B, Data Sucker didn't exist. Next up, we have the other card that I take some serious beef with, and that's Parasite. Like with other cards that I've taken some issue with, I think the concept of Parasite is really good. If the way Parasite had been used is that you play it, and it sits in play, and it slowly accumulates counters, the corp maybe has the opportunity to purge the counters, and then eventually the ice might die. If that had been how the card was used, it would be a brilliant design. The problem is, with something like Data Sucker in the card pool, using Parasite is it's just always going to be killing ice almost immediately, very rarely is it going to sit in play for several turns. It's probably not going to be the case that the corpse is going to purge except in some very rare and kind of extreme situations. So overall, I think the problem with this had a lot to do with the fact that Data Sucker was an option. But I also think that it's kind of lame with all of the mid-run tutor effects like SMC or Clone Chip that you can just outright destroy either zero or one uh, strength ice, depending on if you have Grimoire in play and stuff. And that obviously is only compounded by the idea that you have some data sucker counters as well. So I think one of the things that wasn't anticipated with this card was how strong it was going to be to be able to tutor it up with SMC during a run or be able to clone chip it in play during a run. I think that that's been a, the major problem with this card overall. Again, I really like the idea of being able to destroy their ice. I wish this would have been more focused as like a virus type of card. And I think really the core problem is the fact that you can use it mid-run with the effects I was talking about. Next we have what I think is the least played AI breaker ever, and that's Worm. This thing's got a lot of issues. The three for a subroutine thing I don't think is a massive problem because it's obviously designed to be a pretty clunky POS. I think if this was the way that people interacted with Parasite, like if, like I was saying earlier, if Data Sucker didn't exist and you had Worm Parasite oriented breaker rigs, that would be way, way more interesting than the Data Sucker Parasite thing. As it is, there's basically no reason to play something like this. This It's so expensive to actually break things, so if you're not using it in combination with Parasite, it's essentially useless. I don't think that would have been a big problem if you know there wasn't just a massively more efficient way to do that in terms of Data Sucker. So this is a card that I think was largely overshadowed by the kind of overpoweredness of uh, Data Sucker, and I think it's an interesting concept. I don't think it's a totally flawed idea. I like the idea of some really inefficient icebreakers that have this interesting ability to shrink ice that nothing else can do. But overall, I think this was just a little too weak and it was a little too overshadowed by the other cards I was talking about. Now we've come to the card that I think is the most controversial of any of the Anarch cards in the core set. That's Yogg.0. It might seem like I'm repeating myself, but generally the concept of Yogg is not bad. I really like what it's done for the, the Code Gate metagame, where like Code Gates that have four or more strength are usually a lot higher valued than three or less uh, strength Code Gates. That's interesting. And I like the idea that it's a really expensive, you know, five cost breaker that just totally invalidates these low level code gates when it comes into play. That's really interesting. That could have been, I think, a better design. 
with a few minor changes. The first is a problem I was talking about with Mimic. One influence is really unacceptable for this card. This should have cost at least two, if not three influence. This effect would have been a lot more interesting if it was a lot more exclusive to Anarch, or at least a lot more primarily Anarch. I think it's been pretty lame that most criminal decks, at least in early Netrunner, just imported their entire breaker suite from uh, Anarch, and were also able to import the Data Suckers. Speaking of Data Sucker, I think Data Sucker is another massive problem when it comes to Yogg. And really, the problem is Data Sucker, not Yogg. I think Yogg isn't a terrible design. I think Fixed Strength is just generally a good idea. But Data Sucker makes it entirely too easy to mitigate the weakness of those effects. And another minor quibble I have with Yogg is I think it would have been more interesting if it had zero break all Codegate subroutines rather than it being individually. Uh, there haven't been a lot of ways to punish the fact that you might use Yogg several times, you know, like effects that increase the cost per use or, or something like that. There haven't been many of those. But at the same time, I think we lost some design options by this being able to choose and choose the subroutines that you break. I'm thinking of a card like Little Engine would be a lot more interesting if you were using Yogg Data, Data Sucker against it and you had to break that last sub rather than, you know, having the option to just let it fire. In general, I think the main problem with Yogg is Data Sucker. I'm not totally opposed to the concept of Yogg, and I, I think Yogg has been interesting in certain con contexts. I like what it does to the, the Ice Icebreaker metagame, but man, it's just too easy to combine it with Data Sucker and run over all code gates. Next up, we have a resource that I like quite a bit, that's Ice Carver. This is one of the cards where there's a huge amount of squandered potential. It makes me really sad when I'm flipping through my Netrunner box and I see this card. I really, really liked this card when I first started playing Netrunner, and I think there's a lot of things about it that could have made it a really interesting and competitive card. It obviously has a lot of synergy with the fixed strength breakers that we talked about earlier, this card's just really interesting. It's a good way to save you some credits. It's a resource, which is going to mean that you don't want to get tagged and things like that. I think there's a lot of interesting interactivity with this card, but unfortunately, this was just massively overshadowed by how strong Data Sucker was. And I don't mean to just go on and on and on about how I don't like Data Sucker, but this card really could have been something interesting could have been something good for the game. I think it's a fair design. It's totally an interesting and good design. I like the high influence. I like the unique. Obviously, if you could stack several of them, it'd be really strong. I like the three cost. I think that that's definitely worth it, especially in the modern era where we have some ways to reduce the cost of it with like, you know, career fair or things like that. Man, this card could have been something cool. As it is, I think it saw very limited play because basically everybody just played three data suckers instead of this. For the last Anarch card in the core set, we get to end on a positive note, and that's Wild Side. This has been a card that's been good basically since core set was released. All of the noise decks played this initially. Eventually, they kind of got away from it a little bit. This was really the only way that you could draw cards as an Anarch early in Netrunner, and it was really good at doing that. There weren't a whole lot of draw options. Diesel was really the only other thing that drew you a lot of cards outside of Wildside, and Wildside was just such a powerful engine. It was definitely worth spending that click to draw two cards. This is a card that faded out for a little bit and has now seen a lot more interest in being played thanks to adjusted chronotype, which I think is an excellent design, has really good synergy with this, and I really like the idea of making these two-card combos that are actually worth playing. In general, combos are bad because they rely... Anytime two cards rely on each other to get any sort of real effect, I think it's bad. But I think the wild side adjusted chronotype thing has proven worth it just because wild side is a pretty strong card in its own and the chronotype just makes it a lot better.
I really like this card. Everything about it. The flavor is really nice. It's very Anarch. I like that it's unique so that you can't have multiple of them running. I think the cost is fair. I like the influence requirement. All around, I think Wild Side was a great design. Well, that's all of the core set Anarch cards. I wanted to give a few closing remarks about Anarch as a whole in the core set. I think this review is perhaps the most negative of any of them I'm going to do for these core set reviews, except maybe the Jinteki one. But I think the thing with Anarch was that it simultaneously was too weak in the sense that it, it was missing certain aspects of the card pool that it really needed. Like you'll notice that there were basically no economy cards outside of maybe like Data Sucker in this list. I think Anarch just had way too weak of an economy early in Netrunner, and even to this day, I would argue, has the weakest of, of the three factions. But at the same time, it also had some of the most problematic cards because of their power level. There was a big missed opportunity to make Anarch the faction that had these really unique and powerful fixed strength breakers, as well as Parasite, which was the only way to destroy ice. I feel like in general, those should have been more exclusive to Anarch by bumping up their influence requirements a bit, especially the fixed strengths. Unfortunately, I think that rig, that the, the rig I have on the screen, the one that you sat across from hundreds of times, ha was just too easy to import into every single deck. And I really wish that would have been more exclusive to Anarch. I think that was a big opportunity to make Anarch have a unique strength versus the other two factions. Well, I hope you enjoyed this retrospective of the core set. And if you did, please press subscribe and the button that looks like a thumbs up. And I'll see you again for some more of these core set reviews.